some of the most distinctively Luke contributions to the story of Jesus. And the roads continue still in the book of Acts. We understand that the, the writer of Acts is the same as the writer of Luke. We have the chapter of the story. Uh, the first chapter is the book of Luke about life, uh, Jesus' life and, and death and resurrection. And, and the, the story continues in Acts where this church is born. It's in this book of Acts where, for instance, Paul encounters the risen Jesus on his way to Damascus, another road. There's something about roads. The way roads bring us together, the roads can pose a danger to us all. The roads become a symbol of faith on the move. It's poignant that the narrative of these two disciples on this road to Emmaus draws us to the conclusion of Luke's gospel. The story is a narrative wonder. There's irony, misunderstanding, drama, and a reveal. It's always a story about revelation. These are the components of a powerful story. Moreover, a number of the themes from Luke are woven together into this narrative. These are themes from throughout the entire gospel. There's table fellowship, hospitality, faithfulness, and discipleship. The scene on the road to Emmaus shows us the future of Christ's church. This is going to be a church on the move. It's not a church that stays in Jerusalem, not a church that stays in the tomb. It's a church sent out by Jesus to walk alongside us, even when we don't recognize him. And this walk is one long stretch. By long, of course, I don't mean how many miles. Many of us have walked seven-ish miles in a day. My brother is the Fitbit guy, and he says that's about 14,000 steps. <laughs> it's a long trip because uh, between Jerusalem and Emmaus, the great distance there is the distance between we had hoped and the Lord is risen indeed. And sometimes the distance between those two understandings can seem like forever. Yet if we're honest, I think that's where most of us are a lot of the time in our lives, somewhere between distress and belief. So we understand that faith is a belief in, in something that you cannot see. That means we're in the middle of it all the time. Between disillusionment and acceptance, between dashed hopes and promises fulfilled where the horizons are unseen. The horizons are unseen. And that's where these two are today. And if that's not bad enough, these unseeing disciples are actually so blind that they treat Jesus himself as if he were the one who can't see. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, they say? who doesn't know the things that have taken place there in these days. I think there's some anger and some hurt in that statement. In any case, Jesus does know, and he doesn't take the bait. He simply repeats his question. This is what he does so well. What things? And they reply, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Right? They begin naming who he is and what they'd hoped for. He's a prophet, mighty in word and deed before God and before all the people. Haven't you heard how all the chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him? But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. These are the words that gut me every time I hear them. We had hoped. Hope was a past tense. There was hope. There isn't any more. They had hoped their redemption would come. They now know it would not. They'd hoped. Some might describe what follows as a therapeutic discourse. It's a therapy session that Jesus gives them. As he questions 
and he helps them name in a succinct way the bare bones of their struggle. What's the struggle? A therapist stands as a stranger to our inner troubles, and he thus acts as an uninitiated and neutral party that must be introduced to the dimensions of the problem. If he's going to help, he has to understand. And the patients in this case disclose disappointment and perhaps a deep sickness. I think there's deep sickness in these two men. For that's what despair is. For instance, the disciples characterized the resurrection report of the women as unbelievable, perhaps reflecting their view that women were suffering from a psychological disturbance. They note that what they hear from the women they believe to be an idle tale. The biblical scholars say that what's translated to us as idle tale in the, uh, in the Bible is actually a physician's term to describe the delirious babblings of very sick people. But my wife pointed out to me this week, given the inability of the disciples to recognize Jesus on the road as he walks along with them, it would stand to reason that they regard the women's testimony as nonsense. And this is where Cassie steps in. She states quite sharply, she does not believe it's the women who are delirious in this story. I think that's the case. That's what despair, depression, does to us. It distorts our seeing so horribly that what seems as normal is often the opposite. Luke's narrator fills the account of the resurrection with the paradox of the Christ who is a stranger and a companion. Okay, he's alien to us. He, he comes from outside of us, but he comes, he comes to dwell among us. Augustine, an uh, early Christian father, conveys this beautiful paradox with two sentences. I read this in one of my, um, one of my uh, books to help preachers. I didn't pull this one from the top of my head. He says, the teacher was walking with them along the way, and he himself was the way. And because they observed hospitality, him who they knew not yet in the expounding of scriptures, they suddenly knew in the breaking of the bread. When he expounded the scriptures to them, they still didn't know him. When he explained everything to them, they still didn't know him. It was only in the breaking of the bread that they knew him. You could say the disciples recognized Jesus when he was most Jesus at the table, having gathered the people whom he loved, and breaking the bread. I think it's important that it wasn't just in the breaking of the bread that they had come face to face with Jesus. It was much earlier than that. They had met the resurrection on the road. They just hadn't seen it yet. So what does it mean to meet the resurrection on the road? To meet Jesus as a stranger? when we are between places, and perhaps even beside ourselves. What does it mean to encounter Jesus as a stranger in a strange land? Do we take this resurrection, this homeless one, into our homes? Argument, whether theological or otherwise, is often a struggle for triumph by contracts. Acts of mercy speak the quiet word of communion. Come, all are welcome, Jesus says. And that promise is out there for us. It's a promise extended to us new each day. It's a promise that that I have the joy to extend to you. And you have the joy to extend to me. It's always spoken, but it's not always heard. And if you hear that promise, but you don't quite hear it today, or you don't quite feel it, know that you are welcome by this Jesus who meets us on the road. We are welcome to take part in this meal where Jesus is the host, to encounter Jesus where he is most Jesus at the table. And you are invited to that table today to taste and embody that promise. Jesus was with you and for you always. While the disciples might be disappointed because they misunderstand God's work, their pain and their grief are real. And the first thing Jesus does is invite them to name it. So there's now room to be surprised by God's decision to show up where they least expect God to be. And that still happens. When we name our grief, 
our pain, our disappointment, and fear in the safety of a community that cares for us with the assurances of grace, we find these things that have less of a hold on us and we discover that there's still room to be surprised. We discover that it's when we're laid the most bare, laid the most low, that that capacity to be surprised by God's grace and faith are at their greatest. We discover room to be surprised once again by God's presence and his love and his promises. And so I wonder, what are you grieving? What are you suffering? What are you lamenting? What are you fearing? And whether that thing you fear is real or not, whether that thing you fear has teeth or not, the fear is most certainly real. As we do confession and forgiveness, we keep these things in mind. We keep in mind that there are times when we, like these grieving followers, don't see Jesus in our midst. And after we confess, there's always forgiveness. The forgiveness doesn't take away the sting of missing Jesus' presence, of yearning for it in places where we're convinced he is still absent. But it helps us name uh, those places, the places where we most want Jesus to intercede. And so we continue to pray. Surprise us, Jesus. Allow your promise of grace and forgiveness and acceptance to make room for new realities, for grace that we didn't expect because your work is greater than we could have ever anticipated. We pray, help us look for you in the we had hoped moments and to see you there and to know that in so many ways he has risen indeed. Dashed hopes to burning hearts. Confession to Lord's Supper disappointment to joy. This is the movement of the Christian faith and experience because it is finally the movement from cross to empty grave and from death to life, always, 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 and ever. That walk, that movement is, is, is the church. And that's what the church's call is to be in this world. Be that movement. Be that road. Be that Jesus who expounds the scriptures, who helps understand, and and, and to be Jesus in the presence of community and breaking of the bread. That road is always before us. Jesus always walks with us. And I thank you for being here with me to do this work, my friends. Thank you for not letting me walk this road alone, and thank you for inviting me to walk your roads with you. Thank you for being brave to name those things troubling you so that we might rise to be surprised once again by God's incredible grace in the telling of the stories, in the walking of the roads of life, in the breaking of the bread, in that recognition that he has risen indeed. Amen.